Thank you very much, Brother Fallis. I appreciate uh, all those nice things you say about me. I usually ask a fellow to introduce me with three words and let, and let me have the rest of the time. And if they'll just say that I am a gospel preacher, I'm, that satisfies me. But I certainly do appreciate that. Uh, we're sort of scattered out, and that's all right, because I'm going to give you a test in just a minute. Uh, I first of all want to start with a question. Now, obviously, when we talk about leadership in the Lord's church, we have to center in on some of the leadership that the Lord describes. The leadership the Lord describes, you and I would particularly have involved in three or four words. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, Philippians, that's, of course, uh, Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter, verse 11. Now, Philippians 1 is addressed, the, uh, the book of uh, Philippians is addressed to the elders or to the presbyters and deacons of a group of the Lord's people meeting in Philippi. 1 Timothy 3, of course, has the qualifications of those who desire the office of a bishop, if you've got the King James Version. Uh, and then, of course, Titus 1, for this cause I left you in Crete, uh, that you might uh, set in order the things that are lacking and to appoint elders in every city. Now, with these ideas in mind, we have to sort of center in on, uh, not apostles, because I think we still have the apostles sitting on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, Luke, the 22nd chapter, as uh, the Lord promised that his apostles would, but they're judging the twelve tribes of Israel by the word that they left. That is, they were used by God through whom to reveal the word, and of course, this is the word that Jesus said in John 12, 48, is going to judge us in the last day. So in that sense, I believe that's what Jesus meant in this uh, euphemistic way of saying it, that they're sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So we won't deal with the apostleship tonight, or, or any, any night, but we will deal with the idea of those that are the overseers of local congregations, those that are the teachers, those that are the preachers, those that are the deacons, those that are uh, offering leadership of service in any way in the Lord's church. Now, with that in mind, because you're already so very familiar with 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, qualifications of elders and deacons, let me ask you a question. Where, in, and, and use your Bibles, and I want you to answer me. I don't care whether you're on camera or not. <laughs> if you... If you have answers, I want you to give them to me. Where in the Bible is there said to be anything about foresight of elders? That they must be men that can look way down the road ahead of the common ordinary people. Let me ask you another question to think on. Where does the Bible teach that an elder ought to be enthusiastic? Do you think he ought to be? Well, I do. I think, he, I think he has to have foresight. Now, sometimes we call this vision. Uh, visionary, I'd like to say that a man ought to be visionary, but if you take the strict dictionary meaning of that, you might, you might think our elders are visionary because that's someone who sees, <laughs> who sees uh, apparitions and hallucinations that are not true. I, I don't mean visionary in that sense. But a man should have vision. But where does the Bible say so? I believe a man ought to be enthusiastic. Where does the Bible say so? I think a man ought to have a warm, genuine personality to be an elder. But quote me a scripture. Anybody got a scripture on it? Now, I'm not speaking. I'm saying that particularly applies to leadership in the church, not, not to every Christian. I think there are plenty of scriptures that teach us about some of the things that apply to, to all, uh, all Christians. But where does it say that a man ought to be enthusiastic and ought to have some foresight? Where does it say that he ought to be successful in his line of work? I don't believe it's in there, is it? You can just go down the, the road and you can just see all kinds of things that have to do with basic leadership that are not spelled out in God's Word. And I wonder why. You ever stop and think about it? I'm wondering if maybe the idea of a man being an overseer of the Lord's church, or a deacon, either one, is not someone who, whom Paul has assumed already has qualities of leadership, a personality, 
and a character and a record of being able to be a leader. Now let's find out if he is spiritually qualified to lead the Lord's people. It's interesting to me that sometimes we have the idea that, well, you know, if we would, uh, if we would uh, call on brother so-and-so, it might be that he would sort of blossom. And people would uh, look upon him as a great leader. If we would just sort of put him in the spotlight and, and ask him to serve as an overseer, and, and boy, he would just blossom. Well, folks, if he hadn't already blossomed, he's not supposed to be put in there. <laughs> I, I have sort of a peculiar idea, I guess, about this, because I don't hear other men talking about it very much. But it seems to me that Paul is writing Timothy over there in Ephesus, and he's writing Titus and those in Crete, that look, you, you already have some fellows running around over there that have the respect of their people. They're already standing tall. They are, people are already going to them for advice and counsel and help. and they're, they're already leaders. Now, are they spiritually qualified to lead in a very special way your congregations of people? And so really... Paul does not give qualifications of leadership per se. He only gives the spiritual qualifications of men that ought to already be leaders. In other words, what I'm trying to say is God has already assumed the qualities of leadership. Now he deals with the qualities of spiritual leadership. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. You see, well, let me put it this way. Have you ever seen a congregation where men had these spiritual qualifications but did not do well in leading a group because the people did not respect them? I don't mean that they were immoral or ungodly or unlikable, but they just didn't measure up as leaders within the group. Have you ever seen a man that served as an elder in one congregation and moved over to another congregation and wished to serve there, but he just, just wasn't on the same level? He couldn't be a leader in that congregation, though he had been perhaps a good leader in the other. Why? Well, there are different levels of sophistication and culture and education and experience. And where a man in one situation might emerge as a leader, head and shoulders, I think about King Saul, the physical description of King Saul was what? He stood head and shoulders above the other men of Israel. I think that's physically, isn't it? I don't believe that's uh, spiritually, but he was a tall man, in other words. Well, let's, let's say that men in a congregation might stand spiritually head and shoulders above and be a good leader. And he moves over to another congregation, and there he, he, does, he can only fit in as a follower. It, does that make sense to you? I think it makes sense. I think that's practicality. That, that just simply means that some men can be a big frog in a little pond, and they'd be an average-sized frog in a big pond. May I put it that way? And I mean no detriment at all to, to men. It's just simply that God has given to uh, every man uh, who he is, his personality, his gifts, his, his abilities. And uh, in one particular place, a man might, be, might emerge as a leader. In another one, he might not emerge as a leader. And it is no downgrading to his spirituality at all. It's just simply with whom we are living and under what circumstances we find ourselves. Well, with this in mind, what are some qualities of just plain old leadership that are not mentioned in the Bible? I believe God's assumed that men are already leaders. I've, I've mentioned one or two. Can you think of one or two others? I've mentioned the idea of foresight or vision, the idea of enthusiasm, the idea of being successful in whatever work he does. <laughs> what about warmth and genuine uh, personality? I have worked in congregations where there were two or three men that were really spiritual, devoted men. But they were not respected by a sizable segment of the congregation simply because, because of their lack of business ability in comparison with others in the congregation. Their business judgment wasn't too good. What about that? Is anything said in here about your business judgment? The handling of money? Oh, I, I realize that certain things are sort of implied uh, through there, that if a man's going to be a good family man, 
And if a man's going to be a good father and some other things, that some of these others are at least included to some extent by implication. But what about sharp, keen business judgment? Have you ever run into congregations where there was one man that was a treasurer? One man signed all the checks and thousands upon thousands of dollars went through in the cash flow of that congregation and only one man in the whole congregation even knew what was going on, really, and that was that treasurer. And here are four or five elders sitting over here, and if they want to spend some money, they got to call up brother so and so to find out if they can spend the money. Why? That's one of the that's one of the worst things in the world that can happen to a church. I think they do that treasure a disservice. The leadership of that church is not thinking. They're not using good business judgment, are they? What about protecting that man in case something goes wrong? If he's the only one that signs a check, how open is he to being? Uh, be famed if some money turns up short or a mistake is made. That's ridiculous. There's not a business that runs into the thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in the world that would, that would do it that way unless the owner is the one that does it himself. <laughs> if it's his money he's dealing with, that's the way it'd be. But no other business in this world would turn it all over to a fellow like that, would they? But what does the Bible say about a man being good business judgment, finances, and accounting, and all these guys? But, I don't find anything in my Bible about that. Why? Because I believe that God has assumed that we're dealing with men who are already recognized and respected as leadership in the church. Now, let's look at them from a spiritual viewpoint and see if they are mature as, as spiritual men. And can we therefore use them as overseers of a spiritual group of people? Why do 10% of the world own 90% of the wealth of this country? In last Sunday's paper in the Dallas Morning News, there was a long article by Ross Perot. And I believe he said that 6% of the population of America is providing all of the jobs in America. 6% of the men in America are the ones that are the producers. And all the rest of us are employees to some extent. I'm trying to be a little bit more generous. I believe that uh, reading some of the uh, sociological reports that I have uh, in, in recent years, that we can say 10% of this country or of the world owns and manages 90% of the wealth. Why? I believe 10% of the world is doing the thinking. I believe 90% of the world is not doing the thinking. Who's doing the thinking in the Lord's church? Who's doing the planning? Who's doing the motivating? Who are the movers? Who are the shakers? Who are the leaders? Who are out yonder already doing and saying, uh, come on, folks, we need some help. You want to know why we're not winning souls in congregations? I'll tell you why, because the elders are not out saving souls themselves. Show me a church where elders have one or two nights a week taken up with teaching basically untaught people the gospel of Christ and winning souls to the Lord, and show me one where a preacher is engaged two or three nights a week in the same kinds of studies, and I'll show you a church that is growing a church because they're converting people, and if they're out there doing it, then who's going, what's going to happen to some of their followers? They're going to respect them and try to go out there and help them. Or when an elder is overloaded, he'll, he'll say, you know, I, I'm conducting five or six classes during the weeknights, and I, I've got two or three over here that need to be conducted, and I don't have time. Would, would you come help me? Picking out some men and women in the congregation to help him. The reason that we are not winning souls today is because our leadership is not leading us to be soul winners. Our preachers are hiding behind the pulpits and the classroom and not out winning souls for Christ. Show me an evangelistic minded preacher. <laughs> I'm starting with us preachers, fellas. Show me an evangelistic minded preacher. Show me a preacher that's out winning souls at night, in the afternoons, in the mornings. Oh, I realize that he's got responsibilities to fill the pulpit and teach his classes and all that. Show me a soul-winning preacher. And I'll almost show you a soul-winning church. 
Or show me an eldership that's out winning souls for Christ. I'll show you a soul winning church, a growing church. No doubt about it. But our leadership is not interested in winning souls for Christ. Oh, we get up and preach. Oh, yes, elders, will, they, they'll teach and they'll plead and they'll do all this and they'll plan and they'll promote and they'll revise and, and, and redo all the personal work and, and, and all of this. But how many of them are soul winners for the Lord? That's why we're not winning like we used to. I moved into a congregation a number of years ago that had uh, three elders, and I felt like I'd caught on to a merry-go-round going almost out of speed, out of control, because every one of them were out two and three nights a week in classes with non-members. And any hour of the day or night, elders were bringing people in down to the church building to baptize them into Christ. On and on and on and on. And they still had time for their meetings to plan and oversee. They were still out visiting among the membership. They knew their members. And so I walk in to a marvelous situation, one that I'd never seen before in my life, nor since, very often, where an eldership is really out leading and so on. Well, enthusiasm, warmth, genuineness, they're doing the thinking, they're doing the planning. I believe, therefore, that leadership is assumed by the writings of Paul. What does the New Testament say about confidence? Self-confidence. You go up to a preacher and you ask him about doing something. You go to an elder, you go to a deacon and ask them about doing something. Ask their judgment. Well, let's see. Now, I'm not really sure. It might be this way or it might be this way. or You know, I've come think about it. Let's, let's talk about it, doing it this way. And, all, and wishy-washy, no self-confidence. What would, how many times are you going to go back to him and ask him for advice? I wouldn't go. Don't think you would either. What about his growth habits? Is he growing? Is he learning more about the Word of God? Is he, is he growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Is there anywhere in the Bible that says once a man becomes an elder or a preacher or a teacher or a deacon that he quits growing? Hey, he's on a plateau. That's all he's got to do. What about growth habits? Well, what about imagination? The Bible doesn't say anything about this man having imagination. But every leadership seminar that I've ever attended or even read about centers in on what? A man has to have some imagination. That goes hand in hand maybe with his foresight and vision. But he has to be imaginative. But the Bible doesn't say so. What about uh, flexibility? Bible doesn't say anything about being flexible. Not in those precise ideas. I, I realize some of these things are certainly hinted about. If a man is a good husband and is a good father and a good family man, I guarantee you he's learned to be flexible, hasn't he? <laughs> Only the unmarried would say no on that. But uh, that's part of what uh, good, happy marriages are all about. Is, uh, it involves some flexibility. I'm not talking about compromise. I'm talking about flexibility. But the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Well, what about a sharing attitude? Sharing. What about decisiveness? I don't read that in 1 Timothy 3. I don't read that in Titus 1. Can a man make up his mind? I realize if he's a good man, if he's been a good father and a good family man, if he's uh, already respected by the people and all that, I understand that some of these things are there, but they're there by assumption. Some men have very difficult time making up their minds. But a leader in the Lord's church cannot afford to have that difficult a time. He's got to be decisive. Now, flexible, imaginative, warm, enthusiastic, confident, growing, a whole lot of these things, but he also has to be able to make up his mind. Does he, the old joke is, does he have to go home and ask his wife first? Or after he makes up his mind in the meeting, then he goes home and talks with his wife and calls back to the other man and says, oh, I don't know, I've given this a lot of prayer, and therefore I'm going to change my decision. When really it wasn't the Lord that changed it in prayer, it was his wife that changed it for him. And sometimes we're blessed by the fact our wives do change our minds because we might make a better decision sometimes. Once uh, we bounce some things off of, off of our wives. Be that as it may, 
Now, what I'm suggesting to you is when we talk about leadership and the kind of leadership the Lord wants, there are a number of things that are assumed and implied that are not in just book, chapter, and verse. Now, I'd like to give you a little bit of a test. And uh, if uh, we'd pass these out, I think we have about two dozen of them. Each uh, fold is a, is a, each cut is, a, is separate, there's about three pages in each one. We'll have uh, handouts each night, but this, this has a little questionnaire that I'd like for you to give some attention to for a few minutes. A self-evaluation quiz. Are these all the same, Roy? Yes. Each cut. Just hand a cut to each person. Maybe husbands and wives will have to double up. I don't think I have quite enough for everybody. Your first sheet simply is sort of a, a front sheet. And then you'll find a self-evaluation quiz. Now, no one's going to see this but you. So I would like for you to answer it very, very openly and honestly to yourself. Because I think these are some of the things that will help us to understand whether or not we are growing toward really excellent leadership. Yes or no? Yes or no? Now, I'll read these over as you're going down through them, and if you have any question about any of them, why, uh, I'll be glad to uh, for you to raise your hand there and, and ask it, but uh, for the benefit of our taped audience that might accidentally see some of these class tapes, I want to read through all of them. Please answer these as honestly as you can. You'll profit by such self-evaluation, and you'll not be embarrassed before the class. No one will see the paper that you answer but yourself. Number one, yes or no, do you feel threatened or irritated by suggested changes? Now we're speaking about in group situations like you're involving yourself in church affairs, making decisions concerning church things, classes, worship, whatever. Number two, yes or no, are you annoyed when others suggest improvements in your work? Does it annoy you to have somebody say, wait a minute, I, I think you could do this better? Number three, yes or no, is it difficult for you to admit an error that you recognize? You sort of think in the back of your mind, uh-oh, I may have made a mistake on that, but you don't want anybody to tell you about it, and you don't want to admit it to them. Now, I'm not talking about husbands and wives. I know that's difficult, <laughs> but I'm talking about in, in affairs among people at church. And, and public kinds of things like that in, in our group. Number four, yes or no, do you feel that your co-workers, associates, and friends expect you to be perfect? My, my, they just expect so much out of me. Now, <laughs> boy, if I, if I don't handle this just right, I'm really going to get skinned. Number five, yes or no, when your suggestion is voted down or not accepted, do you find it difficult to redirect your energies to the other decision? Suppose you're outvoted. Well, are you going to say, ah, oh, me, even in your own self, well, I, I don't like that. I'm not going to do that. I'll just follow them. I'm certainly not going to put my energies into that. Now, I'm not saying, are you going to go out and badmouth it around publicly in the, in, in the congregation? I hope none of, none of you would ever consider that. But I'm simply saying, would you just privately feel pretty slow about going along with these brethren that outvoted you? Because you know your judgment is better than theirs. And you're going to sit back and say, oh, my, I told you so when it fails, you see. Number six, do you ever find yourself bothered over a point that all others seem to look upon as unimportant? That gets pretty tough, doesn't it? <laughs> Are you ever bothered or threatened over a point that others seem to think are unimportant? Number seven. Do you prefer to work alone? Yes or no? If you just had this decision to make, you could make it and go, or if you just had this thing to organize and plan and put into effect, these other elders or deacons or teachers get in your way, if they just leave me alone, I'd get this done. <laughs> number nine, or number eight, do you feel threatened 
when an outsider wants to revise your program or your class. Somebody that's not even in the teaching program wants to come up and revise your work. Number nine, are you ever depressed or pessimistic about church work? I have tried and tried this and my, my, it just, I can't ever get those lazy scoundrels to go to work. Number 10, are you in the habit of doing less than your best? Well, I know I've got to teach this class, but I think I'll just sort of uh, wing this thing. Are you, are you capable of and do you sort of slough off, slide into doing a little less than your best? Number 11, do you hide portions of your present life? Are there things in your life that you hide from the public? I don't mean that you keep simply personal or private, but I use the word hide here in the sense of lest you be found out and respected less because of that knowledge. Number 12, do you demand less of yourself than of others? I don't know why brother so-and-so doesn't do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not going to do it, but now uh, brother so-and-so ought to be doing it. <laughs> how many times have you ever run on to ladies that go up and say to the preacher's wife, uh, how come you haven't given a shower for since so-and-so's daughter is getting married? Since I am a preacher and since my wife is a preacher's wife and since she has been approached like this, <laughs> I, this happens to be a pet peeve of mine that sometimes the ladies in the congregation expect the preacher's wife to do a lot of things that they themselves are not willing to do. Uh, do you demand less of, of yourself than others? I always like to tell them they didn't hire my wife too or we'd double my salary. I understand I never did tell any others that, but I wanted to several times. <laughs> Number uh, 13, do you, you ever pass up making suggestions, fearing rejection or embarrassment? In a serious meeting where some decisions are being made, are you ever afraid that you might be embarrassed or rejected, so you just sort of hold off? Number 14, do you feel leaders are generally exposed to too much criticism? <clears throat> Number 15, do you eat the same meals, read the same newspapers and magazines, watch the same TV programs, and associate with the same friends most of the time? If you're over 45 or 50, I know what that answer is going to be, if you're honest. <laughs> I know what it's going to be. Yes or no? Number 16, do you avoid meetings and lectures in other places where you're likely to encounter people that disagree with you? 17, does it disturb you to work with a methodical, careful planner who is sure of his own life's goals? You ever get exasperated with people that are so calm and assured and they, they know exactly what they're doing and where they're going and they keep such good records and such a clean, neat office and all of that? I was with a preacher last week that I I thought I ought to be fired because he had such a wonderful library and all of his notes and everything were in such beautiful order and everything that he'd ever preached or ever taught a lesson on. He had it categorized and cataloged. And, well, those kind of preachers just make me sick. Number 19, 18, do you ever postpone important jobs because you're not in the mood? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I believe I'll wait till I feel better about this. Well, number 19, yes or no, do you ever lose your temper? Well, you see before you a man that's never lost his temper. I never have. I've still got every bit of it <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> have you ever lost your temper? Number 20, or do you, do you lose your temper? Not have you ever, but are you still prone to lose your temper some? Number 20, do you often say things you later regret? My, my. Now, I put often in there because uh, I'm trying to make sort of a, a balance there. Uh, often is very relative. Is it, is, it, is it numerous times or is it just occasional or rare versus the often? Number 21, do you try to cover up your mistakes? Cover up rather than correct. Yes or no? Number 22, do you ever exaggerate or leave out things in order to make you look better? Isn't it hard to be brutally honest with oneself? That's what I'm asking. 
Number 23, does it irritate you to listen to others tell of their troubles? Well, you sure are in for it as a leader in the Lord's church if you don't want to listen to other people's troubles and trials. Number 24, do you ever want to tell them, quote, you ought to hear my story and my situation? You know, the strange part about it is that as you and I sit there and listen to these other people, many times we have faced far worse problems than they're facing. But can we afford to tell them? Well, no. And how do we know what may be their situation is trying them to almost the very limits of their abilities and their experience and their knowledge? That's the difference between leaders and followers, folks. Leaders are more knowledgeable and tougher and more experienced and can deal with more, but followers, that followers can't. Well, the Bible speaks about babes, doesn't it? And full-grown men, Hebrews 5, milk is for babes, but meat is for full-grown men, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. That verse 13 of Hebrews 5. So those that are leaders are men that ought to be able to take more. So it doesn't make any difference whether or not our problems uh, exceed the problems of those to whom we listen, because their problems are about all they can handle at their present time and situation. Number 25, do you ever feel the other fellow with whom you are disagreeing is just plain stupid? <laughs> yes or no? Well, I put a little footnote down here. The most productive leaders will answer all of these questions, no. If you answer six of these questions, yes, this might mean that you need to work on improvement of our own personalities. If you answer eight or ten of them, yes, it might mean you'll have some difficulty functioning well as, an, as a leader. How did you do on the test? I'm not going to ask, really, for anybody to tell me how they did on the test. And I'm not going to say that this is an infallible test. I'm going to say these are suggestive ideas that I have gleaned from many, many others who have studied and uh, worked in the field of leadership and spiritual leadership for many, many years. And I think that these suggestions are good. They're not infallible. And whether you came out with 8 or 10 or 15 or 20, the wrong answer is, don't, don't take that as, as infallible. But uh, take it as uh, suggestions on ways we can improve ourselves toward the goal of being better leaders for the Lord whether it's in our home or in the church or wherever. These same principles are being used by men in leadership seminars in business world. And if you've been in some of those, I'm sure that you see where from, from whence I have stolen a number of my ideas. <laughs> because leadership is leadership, whether it's in business or whether it is uh, in, in the Lord's church. The idea of uh, honesty with oneself, flexibility, the intent to get along and be cooperative, these kinds of things are paramount when we talk about leadership that God wants. Do you remember the names of two ladies whose names have gone down in the eternal book of life because somehow they were disturbing the church? And yet they had been fellow workers together with Paul and evidently were great leaders, <coughs> leaderesses, is that a good word? <laughs> deaconesses or whatever. They, these two women had been true yoke fellows and great leaders in this church, but now something's gone wrong between them. And he writes over there to Philippi and he says, or is it Colossae? Which one is it? Philippi. Philippians 4. And says, I want you to help these ladies. You remember their names? Euodia and Syntyche, isn't it? <clears throat> I don't know what went wrong, but somehow they, they quit working together. And they had great qualities, except they quit working together. And a spiritual leadership, above all, has to be able to do what? Learn to work together. Harmony, unity, flexibility, genuineness, a love for God and a love for his word, and uh, all these things mixing in, but you still have to be pliable enough to learn to work together. You have to respect each other and, and uh, be able to uh, deal with that kind of a thing 
so that we'll not tear up the Lord's church. Do you have now, who me, a leader? Is that one of your, okay. Let's cover that very quickly. I had another handout here that we were supposed to cover four more lessons here tonight. But we'll get to uh, some of that tomorrow. Now, I'll hand it out to you tonight, and, and you can take it with you and uh, be looking it over if you choose to come back tomorrow night. Why do we have so few leaders in the Lord's Church? Let me give you two, three, four answers that you can jot down what you choose on. Number one, I think that there are many who are unaware of their talents. I don't believe this is in the order of importance or in the order of the number of problems. I'm just simply saying these are some uh, thrown together ideas and I'm not putting them in any particular order, but there are many people, I think, that are unaware of their talents. Uh, you can have a man who is a fabulous leader in the business world. He can be a great leader in the social and recreational community in which you live. But when he comes down to try and lead somebody in the church, he, he, he can be totally unaware that people really would like to look to him for spiritual leadership because he feels so inadequate in his knowledge of the Word of God or... He has been a member of the church so few years, or he doesn't have a background, and on and on and on. You, you can recognize the, the, the people in, in your own sphere of life that perhaps can, can be this way. Many men are unaware of their talents. Secondly, uh, there are so few leaders because many are afraid to lead in the church. Their fear of doing something wrong, their fear of not measuring up, their fear of accepting responsibility and things along this line, I, I, I honestly believe that uh, there is a reluctance that borders on uh, the idea of fear in this sense. It's not fright, but it's a reluctance that they might not be able to measure up. Thirdly, we uh, have a problem with so few leaders because a lack of vision. Some men can see four or five years down the road in their business life but spiritually, they're unable to see how some things would be able to work in their life to, to be leaders of the cause of Christ. Uh, years ago, I used to play checkers with a man. And, uh, oh, he was a whiz. He was a, he barely, I don't even think he got out of grade school in Vernon, Texas. And <laughs> he was uh, a great fellow. And uh, it, I never could beat him in checkers. He told me that he could see four to five moves ahead in a game of checkers. But he said he wasn't any good because the fellows who were really good ought to be able to see seven moves ahead in real championship checkers. Well, my, my, if I can see one <laughs> playing against my little granddaughter, you know, when she's three years old, I felt pretty good. Well, uh, that's how little I know about checkers. And because some men know so little about the church and its work and spiritual things and values like this, they don't have that kind of foresight and vision. Therefore, they, 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 they don't serve. Or if they do serve, they don't serve very well. Number four, because they have no training. Many men feel that if they didn't get to go to a Christian college or they have not been through a preacher's school or they have not been in the church for many years or they haven't been able to have the benefit of many uh, 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 years of study and so forth, that, that they are so reluctant that they will not accept the, the position of leadership in the Lord's church. Number five, I think that uh, one of the more, um, one of the ones that is more prevalent than perhaps these others is, they're not willing to pay the price to lead. The toll it takes in time, the toll it takes on a family, the toll it takes on one's children, the toll it takes in the man's emotional stress makeup, the time it takes away from his business. You know, if you're, if you're really the Lord's leader, you're going to be thinking many times during every day, all day, about spiritual matters, where heretofore you've concentrated totally on your business or your recreation or your home or whatever. And all of a sudden, you're now being called upon to think for several hundred people. And that takes a price. If you're going to be a soul winner, you're going to have to give up nights away from the house, aren't you? If you're going to be involved in shepherding people, you're going to have to do what? Give up time with your own family in order to do what? Help other families that are in tragedy and need and stress and trouble. You see, 
And there are many, many people, I'm afraid, that are not willing to pay the price. It is very costly to be an elder in the body of Christ. It's very costly to be a deacon. It's very costly to be a teacher. One of the reasons I'm afraid that we have such poor teaching in a lot of our churches is that teachers are not willing to pay the price to prepare. You know the reason why men do not teach generally in the lower grades? Because they're not willing to pay the price that it takes to do that kind of teaching. You stop and think about it. You look at all of the countless hours that these women put in with handwork and cutouts and decorating and, and various visuals and all of these things that really make up the, the, the good, good teachers among the children. And many men know to do, they know how to do some of those things, don't they? <laughs> I don't have time. I don't want to do that. And I'm probably as guilty as anyone of saying that and, and feeling that way. We're not willing to pay the price to teach that kind of a, of a situation while our ladies, bless their hearts, great spiritual leaders in the Lord's church, pay that price. Well, why me? Why me? Isn't that the next question on your deal? I think because there is a changing world, it ought to be me if I can offer anything at all in the way of leadership. Is it 45 or 50 we quit? Gary? Is it 45 or 50 when I'm supposed to be out? 45. All right. Hang on here then. <laughs> well, no, no. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay within my time. Though uh, Johnny took uh, five minutes to tell Brother Sexton he couldn't have but a minute and a half. Why? I want to stay within my time. <laughs> because the world is changing so rapidly and we need people who will think to get in there and change. And maybe if you and I will accept some responsibility because it is changing. Number two, because of past failures. Because I have failed in the past and because the church and the leaders where I worship may have failed. And maybe I can offer something from my background experience and my thinking and my prayer life that they have not yet thought of that will be a benefit. Number three, because so many people are disillusioned with the Lord's church today, we need leaders as we, as we have never needed before. I was in a, uh, the city of Lubbock uh, this last week visiting, and uh, a man was asking, uh, or we were chatting about some things about why so many young people in the city of Lubbock are leaving the church and going over to a Pentecostal church in that city. And I sat there and thought, oh, how pitiful are the disillusioned persons and young people among us. We need leaders because of disillusionment of the mistakes that we're making in the Lord's church. Number four, because Christ needs leaders as he has never needed before. We have the fastest technology. We have the most rapid kind of changing scene and culture and, and, and uh, the waves of change just continue to, to roll over our situation, if for no other reason, because of the communication values that we have today. I don't think we have all that much more sin in the world. I think we just hear about it and read about it and see it on the television more than we ever have. I don't think the people are any meaner or more sinful. We just know more about it because of the technological uh, explosion and communication values that we have today. Christ needs it as never before. And then the thing that really staggers me is, why has God allowed me to live up to this present time? Number five. Why has God allowed me to live till this very night? Evidently, he still has something he wants me to do as his servant in the body of Christ. I think that's one of the most thought-provoking things that lays on my heart, and I want it to lay on your heart. I really don't believe God's going to let us live any longer than we can be useful. Now, he lets a lot of people live much longer than they are useful. But I don't believe God lets Christians live any longer than they need to live to be useful in the kingdom of God. And as long as we're alive, there's something God wants us to do. As long as we have our, our, our mental health and, and abilities, I realize in the closing stages of life that there may be prolonged illnesses and things like this. But I'm not speaking about that. I'm saying generally, I am alive and well and, and hearty and, and, and functioning for what? For myself? Or for God. Why me? Because God has blessed me and still has been patient with me in my sins 
in my life and therefore still has some use for me in his kingdom. These thoughts are for your consideration. Uh, as soon as we close, please get another one of these. You'll have two sheets in this next cut that have uh, some, I think, some fine uh, suggestions concerning biblical ideas of what God wants out of his leadership. And we'll discuss these some tomorrow night and the following nights. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.